Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, Crypto, and Thanks button in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So, a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Moon Harvest, Amish Earther, Naughty Thumbnails, Mitch Kennedy, Original D Rose, Rod, The Names Burley, Twad Wassel, Jason Hornsby, Christoph Fournier, Flat Earth Travolta, J Mals 24, Yu Namento, M Iron 26, Endless, Flat Earth Sage, Goldie McKinnon, Retro Bill, More Books, Canna Bear, Fiber Oats, Bogey, Michael Kahn, John Kays, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Mel B Styles, Harry Blade, Mobile Mac 777, Rob W, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Maria Neeland, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Abraham Mohammed, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, Tina Baker, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. Hey Brian. Well, how old is your oldest now? Because I remember <laughs> when you first started the show, she was like very young and stuff like Seven. that. Hey Nathan, hey Rachel. What's that? Seven. Hey Brian. What were you saying, Brian? You were saying hello. Oh, that's it? Where is Nathan's hello? <laughs> hey Brian. Hey Nathan, I said it. I said hey Nathan, hey Rochester. So I don't think you heard me. I said hello to Nathan. Oh, right? Okay. Perfect. Everything, yeah, seems normal now. I say. Okay, that's good. As I said before, I'm not any more confident that I have a stable computer, but so long as it can last maybe another at least year, where everyone will forget that I was e begging for it for a straight twelve months solid. Although I wasn't. Paul did actually. Fork out for most of the components. Right. Anyway, hopefully it'll last at least some time. Well, you got a pretty good setup. You got a nice GPU, a nice CPU. Like in terms of uh, performance for gaming and such. Yeah, certainly the GPU is very good because it's modern and it's very efficient. The CPU isn't. It's it's. It's massively underperforming, but it's fine. It would be a great CPU if I could give it 350 watts and cool it, but I can't. I can give it 140 max. I got you, so it's a heat thing. Yeah. Obviously, the more power you can give it, the better the performance is. The faster you can run it, the more cores you can run at higher speed, etc., etc. Well, it is getting cooler now with winter and such, so... Yeah, I suppose that helps to a certain extent. Just glad to be sat here making a show again. Pressing, not doing a show. Uh, but it Nathan... seems like you... you... Oh, go on. No, you go out. I just I'll ask Nathan this and it's okay. I was just going to say, it seems like you still, like, you know, went out with your family. It seems like you guys went out checking a zoo or something. And so you still, you know, took advantage of that. Go on, Brian. They were all booked anyway. We'd have done those things anyway. Anyway, uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, I have a, an iMac. It's 15 years old. And uh, I only really use it for messing around on I don't do anything much serious on it. A bit of music or, you know, watching movies. But the screen went all sideways on it. Started getting those lines through the screen and those kind of pixels. And what I can see online is that it's probably the GPU. Right. Now, um, you don't think it could be the, the RAM overheating, no? No. Or is it... it's, if okay, it's showing then. visual artifacts, pixelation, lines breaking up, things like that, that's always the GPU. Yeah, well, there's no point me trying to fix it then because it's so old. Like, it would cost me probably as much to put a GPU into that as it would cost you to put a GPU into your computer. What year or is even it? If it cost what year? Sorry? What year Mac is it? Uh, 
think it's 2009. I've got a 2009 Mac. Do you want it? Give me. You were going to give me your Mac? You serious? You want it? Yeah, sure. Give me your address and I'll post it to you. Absolutely. I'll send you the address. Are you sure? It's in the garage in a plastic bag. Right. You're welcome to it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Just giving Arwen a monitor. Same thing. He had a monitor break and he was like, oh, now I'm going to have to get a new GPU because my uh, output, well, my general setup, like mine was previously, was DVI only. And his was the same. He's like, oh, I'm going to have to get a new GPU and it's a pain in the ass, blah, blah, blah. I was like, what's the problem? You need a new GPU? And he's like, no, I need a new monitor. But my monitor needs, my new monitor needs to be DVI. And I was like, by coincidence, I have a 1440p DVI monitor that will run at 120 hertz if you overclock it. And he was like, yes, please. So I packaged it up the same day, paid all the taxes and import duty, export duty, all the fines, all the fees, and then shipped it to him the same day. He arrived yesterday or the day before. Well, uh, well, obviously I pay for the post and packaging. Ah, I don't have to do that. Yeah, I'll just send it to you. No, no, just send me the no, address on Skype that, and I'll send it to you. No, no, I will. That'll be a heavy unit. That'll cost a few bob. Uh, not you to Ireland, I mean? it won't. It's not going to. It's not going to. You're not really abroad. Because you are, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> you, the point. you are abroad. I'm <laughs> yeah, spending 50, 50 bob. Anyway, it's I mean? not a big deal. No yeah. worries. Don't worry about it. If it happens to cost a shit ton, I'll tell you. And I'll, yeah, okay. I'll ask okay. you. But Excellent. I doubt it will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much appreciated. No problem. Uh, because I, I, I wasn't going to do one with the other one because I got I got a power surge there uh, into the into it uh, about three years ago. Uh, there was The power went off and the power came back on in the middle of the night. Went off and on in the middle of the night. And the, it, the power surge blasted something. I think it was the could be the same unit, I'm not sure. But it's just, it's an old computer and it's overheating and the heat just probably destroyed the GPU um, over time. And there's no point in me putting more money into it because it's just too old to, to, to you condone. Can't upgrade. Well, that's why I, st- I chucked it in the garage. Eventually it reached an operating system. I think it was, I upgraded it to Snow Leopard and then it wouldn't let me do anything else. Oh, that's the best one. That's the best one. That's a little bit like having XP on, on your Windows. Okay. Computer. I mean, I couldn't do yeah. anything with it, though. I mean, it reached a point where I couldn't figure out how to get it to load YouTube, so I gave up. Now, I'm sure as a Mac user, you could figure that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, that, that's our time. They've, they, they've kind of relaxed on some of that stuff. Some of the things that, because they realize that a lot of people have old computers, and what was happening is, they just weren't able to use their computers anymore. And so there was a lot of stuff they weren't doing on the computers that they would have been doing. And I think they kind of realized that, you know, trying to phase out all these older computers, because a lot of them for basic use, there's no need to phase them out. You're not doing that with them. That's anything spectacular. At the time, it really annoyed me because it was, it was used specifically bought for a kitchen computer. So what it was, it had all the music on it, it still has, and I'm not going to bother wiping it. You can, wipe it yourself i'm not gonna bother doing that anyway it was just in there as a jukebox and to play youtube videos for cooking literally that was what it was for web browsing when you're cooking something but because it's permanent i it's a you know it's all in one it's all in the monitor it was quite neat it didn't you know you could clean around it very easily and just slip it forward because there was no one wire because it was wi-fi so there was one wire to the power that's it so you could move it out of the way if you needed to clean underneath it and you could have a web browser in the kitchen without having to, you know, use your crappy little phone. But as soon as they stopped it, use it, stopped YouTube on it, I was like, all right, that's it. This is now useless. So you just end up taking, or I do, take the iPad in if you're going to do the same thing. But it's so surplus I, requirement. I, I, I was using it for the same thing. I had it in my, in my kitchen and I was using it for uh, basic web browsing and if I wanted to go on Skype, um, yeah, exactly. You know, That's exactly, exactly what I was using it for. Web browsing and Skype conversations so that you don't have to come into the lounge to fire up Skype. Now, like I say, iPad replaces all of those things. In fact, the iPad directly replaced that machine when I got it originally. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's if it's got a use to you, I'd rather it go to you than it sit in the garage. Well, thanks very much. I'm appreciative of that because either way, I'll get some use out of it. I will Definitely. get use out of it. I love it. 
No, yeah, for it's sure. not a juice in a garage. No, it won't. No, I, I owe you one for that. That's excellent. No problem. My what? pleasure. I'll check it works first. <laughs> I will plug it in and make sure it does actually still turn on because it's been in there for a while. Do you know what it is? I have an old MacBook, a 2008 MacBook, and I have that in the kitchen now. And that is, like, that's about to explode, <laughs> right? Because the heat and the fan and it just goes crazy. I have a newer Mac, I have a newer uh, MacBook Pro, but I don't want to start using that for every bit of nonsense. I want, that's to me is like with your computer, you want to have it for what you want to have it for. That's like uh, you want to do a work on that and have all the things that matter to you to do a flat earth and everything on that. I don't want it, to correct. have to. Yeah. I don't do any. I don't do any web browsing intentionally on this computer. So there's no shopping done on it. There's no general web browsing the only exception being youtube very specifically and all the software i use now other than that the only thing this computer is used for when it's shut down is either playing minecraft if my daughter wants to play that or if my wife wants to watch disney or netflix or whatever she watches but other than that it's not used like most people would use a computer so if my wife wants to do a bit of e e begging or e begging e baying she'll do that on uh, her laptop or if I want to do editing, I'll do that on my iPad. So that things that are de not demanding, just you could potentially download something you shouldn't, for instance. I don't ever want any of that to ever happen to this computer. So it's kept sacrosanct away from all that kind of stuff, that type of use. And then your yeah. local self-contained iPad, or in my wife's case, a laptop, That if that goes bang, not the end of the world. You know what I mean? This goes bang, well, like over the last week, and it is the end of the world. It's cost me a fortune, as much as it might not seem it. The reason I churn out videos is because I need to to keep the money coming in. Now, it's not the case that I'm only doing it for the money. I don't know. Do I need to make all these disclaimers in the pre show? No, probably not. But the point is, I do it for a living. Therefore, if I stop doing it, it's like a plumber. If he stops going out and doing the jobs, the money stops coming in. Well, if I stop producing the video, the money stops coming in, which is disastrous if it happens for 10 days or more as it just has that has a significant impact on my revenue so it just means i've got to obviously cut back drastically um in the meantime but if that happens because i've downloaded some stupid virus because i've been looking at pornography or whatever else i've been looking at on my ipad then that's disaster You're like no keep certain things like web browsing on your ipad or on your app laptop not on the main house computer because then you know like say even if it's you not a youtuber in other words normal person listening to this and you've got a house computer that you watch netflix on don't web browse on it don't do your shopping on it do that on something else you know, keep them separate yeah exactly because what i like to watch is i like to watch movies um to relax and i watch old movies new movies in between and the sites i go to they're normally okay but you will get pop-ups and stuff and you ha stuff happening on them. And because you're going to streaming sites, and the thing about it is, is that you will have nonsense popping up that you don't want that to deal with. But you can't stop it popping up. All you can do is get rid of it and just, you know, get rid of it off your, out of your face. But I don't want any of that. I'm the same with you. I want none of that on my, on my work computer. Because I, view it, I, I view it as a work computer. I don't want anything like that on that. I only browse what I need to browse for what I want, for whatever I'm doing on that computer. Exactly. And other than that, it's kept yeah, safe. Precisely, the pop-ups are the main reason. So, although, I'm sure I said this on Friday, strictly speaking, the computer's back on Friday, and with nothing on it, just bare-bones windows. Now, at that point, you could go, well, what, what is it, an hour to download all the software you need? You go, well, yeah, but it won't work correctly. And pop-ups... So the computer, when you first get it, I say I first get it, it's because Windows is new. It's like, a, as per a new computer, you get all sorts of things that are just happening. Suddenly a, a pop-up for the for the system itself will come up and tell you that you need to do something, install a driver, for instance. Now, if that happens during a show, it just looks very unprofessional. Now, as much as we're having a fairly laid-back conversation now and it is being recorded, it's far more professional for us to be chit-chatting about this stuff than the middle of me talking to you suddenly over where it says Brian's logic. Pop, you need to install DX12 drivers. You're like, what? <laughs> no, no, go away. I'm in the middle of 
a show. This is recording. You know, those sorts of things, as much as most people probably wouldn't care, they're like, well, you're using a computer, those things are going to happen. It really, really bugs me when I watch other people's streams. It just spoils the magic. You know what I mean? When you can see that it's yeah. just their desktop and they're just scrap capturing the desktop. And you're like, yeah, but it looks crap. It looks so unprofessional. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you want your show to run uh, like a television program or, a new, let's say, the news. You don't want any mishaps. You don't want any lackadaisy stuff or you don't want, you know, stupid stuff. You don't want the, the, the audience to be shown. If you understand, like, if, if you're, t you're talking about a television set, you yeah. want it to be as professional as that. That's exactly. the standard. You know what exactly. I mean? There's a certain standard that you want it to come across as, like it's polished. And why? Well, because it is. Because I've spent the last three days polishing something that's been already, you know, machined up to a very high shine to begin with, but it's just got a bit of dirt on it, so it needs a bit of polishing. Well, that kind of polish, you know, I'm, I'm fastidious about it, but I'm also quite proud of that fact. You know, when you said that, you left me a comment while I was off air, going, you know, your show's top quality, basically. And it really cheered me up. And I do get those comments now and again from various random people, unsolicited. They'll just say, your show is of a very high standard for these reasons. And you go, that really makes it worthwhile because those are the standards I'm trying to attain. Now, in those standards, they weren't production standards you were talking about. They were discussion standards. doesn't matter what the standard we're talking about. If there's any standard to be had, I want it to be high. Now, at the moment, the, <laughs> right at the bottom of the list, in standards terms, is the language. Now, that is also a smile. I shouldn't. It's also affected me financially. Every single time there's a an F word in a show, it will get demonetized um, and just go to the lower state of advertising revenue, which is pennies rather than dollars. Literally, cents. You you earn a few cents per video. You're like, oh. Now, don't get me wrong. The super chatters do make up the predominant part of my income anyway, but it's still a case that I still have a chunk of revenue that comes from, from ads. So when that dries up because, you know, there's just too much swearing, you're like... I've got to do something about this. <laughs> but when yeah. there's, you know, when it completely dries up because the system's offline, then it's just like the brakes come on, <laughs> all revenue stops, and you just watch the stats plummet, and you go, oh, no. <laughs> well, it, well, we have to make a better concerted effort then it's because it, it's not fair if you're losing revenue because we curse. Because sometimes it comes out natural. It just, it's just the natural next word is an F-bomb. Let's just say, we much are trying to say to extenuate, or uh, to, you're trying to uh, exaggerate. Exa yeah, it is exaggerate. Yeah, you're trying to exaggerate Exager the point you're making. Yeah, the, 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 the passionate side of what you're trying to say. And I don't want to stop that. That's why it's yeah. low priority. As much as it's that balance where if I did say, no, you must not swear, I will actually remove you if you say the F word, then suddenly you lose that spontaneity that people have, that passion that they have in the moment. And most of the time, once there's been one or two swears go by, I just think, well, that's it now. It doesn't matter anymore. So you just think, well, if that's the attitude after a couple of swears because of YouTube's algorithm, I'm just going to have to accept that attitude 100% of the time and just smile about it and just accept my fate in that regard because you, you can only push it so far. If I did push it that far, people would be justified in saying, nah, you are only interested in the money now. And that shows you're putting the show, you're, you're making your guests behave in such a manner that it's to the show's detriment so that you earn more money. And that is where I draw the line. You're like, yeah, there's going to be swearing. People swear. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. What can I do? So I don't want to necessarily put the kibosh on anybody swearing. I do encourage every single show people not to swear. And that's as much as I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep it in the intro. This discussion serves as a, you know, not a marker or a warning to anybody, but it's just, you know, heads up. It does affect me. But by the same token, I don't want you to have it prevalent in the front of your mind when you're talking about the physical geometric sphere edge horizon that doesn't exist or the, as QE's currently vibing on, the fact that they, they can't have a horizon on a globe. Yeah, well... The thing about it is, is that, is that if you take the swearing out, you take away the natural, and yep. that's the unfortunate part about it. And YouTube know this. You know they know 
that that's, that's especially if you're from if you're from the UK or Ireland, swearing is just a second nature. Maybe not as much in America because there's so many Christians and now there's so many people that try not to swear. But swearing, you know yourself, going up in the UK or Ireland, same thing. Uh, swearing is just part of vocabulary, so it's very hard to not do it. In in you know public in or in private, but broadcast is different. So in Ireland and England, it made no difference. Before the watershed, when we were growing up, there was no swearing. And if somebody accidentally swore, usually on live TV, so morning breakfast broadcasts that were live, and they'd have a guest, you know, it's the Philip Schofield and Mark Sargent scenario. And in the heat of passion, Mark Sargent says the F word. That would make headlines. F word before the watershed. Well, that's because that's the standard YouTube now want to attain. So I know you're right. It does stifle natural conversation, but this isn't a reality show, is it? It is. We're dealing with the nature of reality. But what I mean by that is it's not a reality TV show. Well, everybody is is not on camera and you're not in a studio. So if you're in that environment, it's a lot easier to not swear because you want to not swear. You want to present yourself the best you can in front of the camera man, let's just say. Not a camera on your phone that you can decide to have on or not have on. For most people, it's just on the phone. So we are all here. I'm not showing my face here. You're not showing. Although you do show your face during the show uh, at parts, but most, most of us, we're not showing our faces. We just have, and people don't want to see them either. They just want to see the, they just want to see the, um, the, um, oh, what's the name of them? The little, your little symbol. Like I have the Brian's logic symbol. I can't remember the name of the thing. Avatar. Uh, uh, yeah, Avatar. Sorry, your little Avatar. They just want to see that. They don't want to see. They don't want to see your face, and they don't. We all don't want to be looking at each other while we're talking, because what's more natural, uh, we can speak then more naturally. Whereas if you're going to be in a studio, like on a TV set, you don't want to swear. You want to not swear. You're not going to be. It's a lot easier to not do because you don't want to do it, as opposed to on YouTube where you, where you naturally want to do it, but you're, you haven't to stop yourself. You know yeah, what I mean? It's to... kind of psychological. They're trying to shed that image, though, aren't they, YouTube? They, 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 they want to replace TV or replace terrestrial TV, let's just say. The, the bog standard you get if you've not paid a dime instead of terrestrial TV. Not true in all countries. Not true in the UK. But that's the standard they want to replace. You know. But if you're going to be unilaterally accepted, there's got to be a standard in terms of... It's just a shame there's no watershed on YouTube, right? Because it's... You can click on anything at any time, so therefore the standard has to apply always, which is a bit of a shame because on, on, you know, even BBC, after nine o'clock they could get away with swearing, and they did. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I think YouTube are kind of, as you said yourself, YouTube are kind of like the new TV. They're kind of heading in that direction, so uh, they want it to become more professional uh, and. They will have, like, I mean, you look at the certain shows on, you're going to have situations where there'll be shows on YouTube and there'll be as many people tuning into them as there is to the night, on the nightly news on television. You know, it, it's on the way, but it's just not there yet. No, not quite. And, and you can't expect average Joe Normie, if average Joe Normie can have an account, to be able to be producing decent material. But again, YouTube have gone a bit too far recently where all they've done is promote the YouTube version of BBC One. Okay. <laughs> it's like, well, if you're just going to put the material that's on broadcast TV on YouTube, <laughs> it's just like, it, it steals any semblance of uniqueness that YouTube had. If, you know, yeah, you can yeah. put a video on there, but by the same way, what, you could set up a, 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 a broadcasting station and broadcast probably not legal actually but you know what i mean if it wasn't illegal to yeah. just broadcast you could see what you could go to your radio shack set up an antenna or a broadcasting uh amplifier and and broadcast like pirate radio did yeah you can but your five listeners aren't going to really care 
and if your five watches on YouTube, and that is true for everyone that's just like, look at my cat, and it's not interesting. Yeah, they did. They don't get any views because nobody's going to twig onto it algorithmically. But if the stuff that in years gone by algorithmically people were just interested in looking at, therefore clicked on and therefore became popular, isn't what's promoted at the front of the lists to begin with. That stuff will never be clicked on and therefore be getting shared around because they happen to have seen it on YouTube. It'll just be, I saw what CNN said on YouTube. It just becomes a website that happens to host CNN, ABC, BBC, ABC, etc. Hey, John. Well, hey, John. Hey, what's up, what's up? I'm hoping you two can chat amongst yourself just so I can grab a drink. I've got five minutes before we go live, so I just want to grab a drink and make sure I'm ready. Yeah, um, what was y'all talking about? Uh, was it just mentioning you it? Oh, y'all weren't talking about the, the whole uh, video we watched in the After 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 show? No, no, I didn't mention it at all. We're just talking about YouTube and about... Um, Basically, uh, how they're trying to become more professional and how they're kind of really cutting out swearing and stuff like that. And we're just saying how difficult it is not to swear on YouTube where you can just be an avatar. And it's natural sometimes to swear within a, a sentence because that ex exaggerates your point. You know, whereas, as Nate was saying, if you're on television, you can't swear. But the thing about it is YouTube wants to become more that kind of way, that more, more that kind of professional, want to be more professional like that. And it, But if you're on a, I was saying to Nathan, if you're on a TV program, you don't want to swear. If you're there in front of a cameraman in a studio, swearing is not what you want to do. Whereas on YouTube, you have the, you're more swearing, because you're just an avatar, you feel free to just speak normal. And as you would normally would, as if you're just speaking to somebody in your kitchen. But uh, they're trying to get rid of that. They're trying to get a change their uh, their image. Uh, but they always. I don't think they can do it though, because they all well, they can up to a point, but they're going to have a lot of amateurs, a lot of troyers, and a, and a few professionals. That's what they'll end up with. Right. Well, the the whole thing about YouTube is the appeal of it was that you were getting other uh, other forms of. Uh, you know, non-mainstream, uh, mainstream. right. So if they're going to make it mainstream, then something else will replace it. That's just the way of the world, you know. Something becomes so popular, it becomes mainstream, and then, you know what I mean, it's commercialized and done to death, and something better comes along. It's, uh, it's just the way of capitalism, you know. Yeah. You know, I suppose YouTube are getting so big, they have such power now, they really, uh, how, do you, how, how do you not use YouTube? You know, how could you avoid using YouTube and use the internet and still trying to deal with anything you're trying to do? It's going to be very difficult. Even with all the other platforms out there, YouTube are still, they have, they've cornered the market. You know, it's like, how do you avoid Amazon? You know what I mean? You can't. You know, they've become if too big to fail in If you're going to do anything DIY and you don't know about the topic, you know, it, you have to have YouTube. Like, there, you can read all you want to, but until you see someone do it, it doesn't seem in in your mind. You know what I mean? Well, think about the amount of people that didn't get electrocuted because they looked at YouTube on how to, how to correctly wire a plug. You know what I mean? <laughs> Little things like that. They didn't cause a problem in their home or they didn't cause something to short because they looked at the correct way to, to wear a plug on YouTube. They didn't have to ask anyone um, um, and be embarrassed about asking someone. They could literally just see YouTube and YouTube at home. So where else would you go to learn to wear it? something as simple like wear a plug? A lot of people don't know how to wear a plug because it's not, they've never, they might have never had to do it. It might be the first time someone ever has to do it. Could be a girl living in an apartment. She never had to wear a plug before. You know what I mean? So she doesn't know how to do it, but she's too embarrassed to ask someone how to do it. You know, I can never. YouTube is where you get that information. Oh yeah, and that, that was part of the, its appeal was that you know people were sharing information. It wasn't, um, you know what I mean? It was. It's losing that 
slowly. Yeah, the information share power because up to a point it is, yes. On Ballbusters, Arwen did a pretty atrocious job of concisely summarising his own paradox, <laughs> which he coined the name of when he first concisely summarised that you can't get an R value from a geometric horizon to refract the horizon with the R value. There you go. I polished that up overnight while I was thinking about it. So that's the Arwinian paradox. But when Arwin ball did his Ballbusters summary, it was terrible. It took about five minutes. <laughs> but that, Brian's just done an equally good job of explaining why. Now, over the... I don't know, I haven't been paying close enough attention because of a computer error and because of various other bits and bobs that have been going on. I didn't get a chance to listen to Huey's full show on why the ball, that would be a globe Earth, can't even have a horizon in terms of the rate of change when you're describing slope versus curve. Now, I'm sure he will go through this on at least eight more occasions, as I can, you know, having heard it twice, <laughs> be able to at least repeat it without necessarily understanding how to argue it. Um, which is probably, I'm going to assume, the same as many people who are listening who may have heard this, even the ones who've heard it on Ballbusters, which might be me included in the last if I'd have listened, which I haven't. Not Ballbusters, QE Live. Uh, speaking of which, there's a QE Live tonight, but it's a, a slightly earlier time, so it's 6pm UK time. So there's a, a change of time and a time change that's occurred. So I noticed it in the uh, one of the skype feeds so if you are going to tune in for actual flat earth information from quantum eraser at the source of it all then tune in today on the quantum eraser youtube channel be here or be sphere for quantum eraser live and uh, i assume he's going to be going through exactly that that we've just discussed in regards to how you cannot have a horizon on a sphere earth it, it, it's something that could not exist so he'll go through yeah. that tonight a tonight show is based on the well, the, the basic uh, presentation is going to be the time zone presentation, time zone terror. But I'm sure he will go through that because, um, I mean, the whole point is that the horizontal, the word horizontal is derived from horizon. We all horizontals are parallel to each other, as Bev says, and all horizontals are parallel to the plane of the horizon. It's true. You know what I mean? That's where we get horizontal from. Um, you, like. And horizontal is a uh, rate of slope zero. So anything that uh, has a rate of slope is not horizontal, which would be, you know, an elevation change, which would be, you know, the horizon would have to be, you'd have to be able to, uh, you know, between you and the horizon and the horizon itself would have to have a rate of slope that isn't zero. You know, that kind well, you know. of, you know, well, well, further to that as well, just to not to talk about the horizon, but just level and horizontal. All mathematics utilize level as horizontal. If you're going to say the surface level is curving, you invalidate earth curve math mathematics, orbital mechanics, celestial navigation, pretty much everything that you would consider to be a globe uses level as horizontal. So... Well, it, someone actually um, pointed this out in the comments. So, uh, shout out to you. It's actually one of my members, LLB Store. So, shout out to you. He, he also referenced this back to Bev. Now, maybe it will become more apparent why both you and LLB Store reference this back to specifically Bev in this regard. But there we go. I'll just read out his comment. It says, Bev checkmated to confront flat Earth. Let's create a virtual rectangle. I'm standing at sea level. Make the virtual rectangle 30 miles above me and 30 miles below me in height with a width of 20,000 miles to the left and to the right of me, would all humans within our known continents be within this virtual rectangle? Question mark. If so, welcome back to Flat Earth. Well, that was a really well laid out comment, LLB Store. The only question is, why was that reference to Bev? <laughs> but there we go. I mean, maybe you just happened to be watching Bev. Same as you, Brian. I can ask you and then contextualise it with LLB Store's comment. Because you referenced it back to Bev also. So although I won't find out from LLB, I'll find out from you because you also did it. So why did you do it? Well, Bev always says, I mean, uh, uh, Bev, take, I, think, I think it's just the official, an official way of saying it or an official definition that all horizons are 
parallel to each other and all horizons are parallel to the plane of the horizon. Bev, I, I'm pretty sure I have that verbatim that Bev always says it that way. And he never deviates from that. Sorry, just repeat it. All parallels... All, all horizontals... All are horizontals parallel. are parallel with the plane of the horizon. Correct? Uh, no, it's all horizontals are parallel to each other and all horizontals are parallel with the plane of the horizon or to the plane of the horizon. All horizontals are parallel with each other. That, to me, seems... Almost redundant. But then again, you've got to kind of say what it is to say what it is, I suppose. But the second bit, and all horizontals are parallel with the plane of the horizon. I just want to get that bit because that's the more um yeah. more pertinent bit, especially in light of QE's description of no horizon on a ball. When you're saying because Bev, I may as well reference it back to him. Shout out to you. Um, describes this or concisely summarizes how all horizontals will be parallel with the plane of the horizon, therefore no horizon on a ball. Yeah, well, in fairness to Bev, he was saying it some years ago, like, he was pointing... Bev works just basically off of basic geometry and surveying. It's like he gives it as simple as possible. So he was saying it years ago, the horizon is horizontal. Like, that's why that's why he... That's part of why he, uh, I'm sure, why he used the water level as an argument so much. Because it's like, it, the water level, and this is pretty much verbatim as how he says it, the water level is a tool that establishes a horizontal plane of reference. Now, we, we know it does, but the ballers obviously can argue against that. But the point is, is that's what it establishes, a horizontal. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, it's... But like it's just impossible for the for the globe to have an horizon, because horizon is where we get the word horizontal from. That can't exist on a globe. But it's that simple, isn't it? A keen audience already up to fifty two people watching, and we've only been going about what ten minutes. Wonderful. Please share the show. A very warm welcome. It's good to be back on the air and actually interacting with you as an audience and indeed my own panel for that matter. Hello, QE. I that that was a profound statement. Hello, boys. Boys can't have a horizon. Hey, can can't have a horizon on a globe, man. You go through this. Yeah. You said that in terms of the rate of change with a curve versus a slope. Now I've heard it a couple of times, but there's no way I understand this yet. So go ahead. I just woke up, and I I still think I can do it. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so. Horizontal lines are derived directly from the horizon. According to the slope-intercept formula, the slope for a horizontal line, as everyone knows, is the baller's IQ, zero. Whereas the definition of curvature is the rate of change of slope. So uh, Lucy got some splaining to do. Because let me just, let me just you repeat can't that. Have so, slope, you can't, I, I, I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. You can't have slope of zero with a horizon. Everyone knows. Everyone sees the horizon, right? You can't have a slope of zero on a substance that has a non-zero slope. Curvature. End of end of charade. It's all over. Okay. So let me just repeat that back to you. So you can tell me if I understand or not. You're saying okay. that a curve is a rate of change in slope. No, curvature. Curvature is the rate of change of slope. And a, a horizon has zero slope. Horizontal Correct. has zero slope. Therefore, the very definition of what gives you horizontal aka the horizon in this instance, isn't conducive with something that has a zero value for slope when curvature is rate of change of slope. Is that correct? Right. Okay. It is simpler than I thought. It's very simple. That's good. I like that. I like the simple ones. <laughs> yep. <laughs> three times. I've only heard that three times and I understand it. That means it's good. <laughs> if it's 10... <laughs> That's not good. If it's 20, it's Coriolis effect. 
I still didn't get that. To the day that I went on Globebusters, you were still casting your mind back, what, six years? Um, when I went on Globebusters and I was, I was asking you to explain how to spin positively the gyroscope into Coriolis, your advice, very well taken, and I took it, was don't use the gyro. Use something else that has the same motion, the same effect, which in the case that I used, I turned it into the pendulum because it was less combative. In other words, when explaining to Bob, who essentially had affirmed the consequent on behalf of the Globe live on Netflix, as live, I should say, on Netflix, um, only to then <laughs> confirm the affirming the consequent <laughs> and say, oh, no, actually, um, ether. Anyway, when I did my critique, it's how do I approach this without completely demolishing their notions of what their gyroscope should or shouldn't be doing? And the answer was, according to QE, don't use the gyro, just use the pendulum. Because then there's so much less personal attachment to your example when you describe how Earth's claim to turn underneath the back and forth motion of the pendulum. Therefore, Earth's turning underneath stuff. 15 degrees now noticeable in airplanes. That was the point I was trying to get across to them. If I had have, as I originally intended, had it not been for the advice of Quantum Eraser, who is amazing, you just use their gyro, because aren't I clever? Look, I'm using your gyro to spin it into how the Earth isn't turning. See how many puns there was in there? Anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, if I'd have done that, they'd have been on the defensive. Not that they weren't yeah. anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it was very good advice. Um, not only that, I, the reason I'm making this point is to say that even then, I still didn't have a full handle. I still didn't have a concise grip on Coriolis effect. And although you did, you were still trying to wrap your head around how to explain to an audience how Coriolis effect and the earth turning underneath stuff aren't the same thing. You have to detach them. Once you understand the principle of Coriolis effect and how Coriolis effect is a non-inertial turning reference frame underneath an inertial reference frame, when it comes to referencing the globe Earth turning, forget Coriolis. Just forget it. Just now understand that you've got an Earth that's turning underneath stuff and what would happen as a result of that. So you had to kind of take people along a path of understanding Coriolis to then tell them why they need to forget it. Now, <laughs> what happened as a result of that was the Globus just took immediate advantage of that, didn't they? Because they were saying, yeah. well, let's, let's forget the effect of Coriolis because we had detail it from the projectile's point of view. <laughs> now fondly named Globiolis effect and various other iterations. But, you know, th they always take something that we use as a tool here on Flat Earth Debate or on Quantum Racer or Ball Busters or wherever we may be. Um, they'll take what we use as a teaching tool to try and not dumb things down or not even oversimplify things, just make them concise and easy to understand and get the person to relinquish an aspect of it so that their understanding can debunk a globe. The Globers will see that as a crack that they can be opened up and exploited to get their own side to forget about what Coriolis really is when detailing our pendulum, uh, not pendulums, aeroplanes drift. Hey, hey, Wolfie. <laughs> you clown. Anyway, there's a lot of fun to be had with these complicated <laughs> subjects. Not. But there we go. Yeah. I, on that, on that uh, claim that airplanes are drifting, or that they're correcting for Coriolis, so... <laughs> to, Wolfie the uh, dumbass. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help it. Go ahead, John. Right, they're claiming a latitude-based Coriolis, where as you change in latitude, um, Coriolis will either increase or decrease, or what they say is Coriolis, and what we've called Globiolis. Didn't, but they, have, get latitude. didn't they have a device to correct for Coriolis deviation? Yeah, that makes it actual, though, doesn't it, Arwen? This is the point that John's getting there, I'm sure. But you get your latitude to begin with. Oh, he wasn't going where I thought he was. <laughs> I love these moments. Uh, why didn't I hear the sound of a V12 going by that highway over my head? <laughs> All I'm thinking about is, no, what they need to focus on, how the non-inertial turning reference frame that you're observing Coriolis from has you as part of it, and the effect that you're observing is a not-actual drift. Therefore, how can you have the induced amount of drift corrected for or induced based on a latitude system when it's a not actual deflect no 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 that's not where john's going refractive curvature is going 
What he's done is he's hopped into his Lamborghini about 20 minutes ago, buckled up the seatbelt and listened to the tunes. And then when he's ready to go, he's done not to 200 over the highway, over the top of me, that is Coriolis Effect, and pointed out that as soon as they use Globiolus with a latitude-based deviation that's actual, they'll need a flat earth to get the latitude-based system. Right, John? You're going to need a flat earth for that? Yes, sir. All roads lead to flat earth. Speaking of which, any evidence that you can acquire an elevation angle measurement from... I'll say that again. From a curved baseline. Only if you use curved geometry with curved angles. No, that, that would be oh, utilising a presupposed spherical earth and drawing to that presupposed spherical. Did I not repeat from twice? I'm sure I did. Well, from to doesn't really matter. Uh, you're, not on, you're not on ball busters. You don't have to go down your mic. You, just, you blew everyone's eardrums off, Arwin. Oh, sorry. It's all right. I'm very sensitive to such things. 60 people watching, please share the show. Warm welcome to you all. Go ahead. Was that Brian? Yeah, well, if you, if you pre-assume that you had a geometric globe horizon, but it was a refracted position, and you've done your hoi-to-foi slash dip correction based off of that refracted horizon, that can't exist, uh, then you might be able to create a tangent plane and then take an angle off the tangent plane. But you will only be allowed to have one vertical perpendicular to that tangent plane, even you though it will have to be a horizontal. Sorry, I like your use of weasel words. Take a tangent from, did you say? Yeah, well, you're going to create a tangent. That would be your... 90 that would be your uh that would be your horizontal yeah that's two loading. though isn't it when yeah. you say create a tangent you're drawing a straight line that you're going to call a tangent to this and you've already disclaimed that it's not possible to acquire unless you've got a flat earth ball that's that's not acquiring it from a curved surface that's drawing a straight line to a presupposed spherical earth that's going to be derived the presupposition will be derived from a flat earth measurement in the first instance not that you're disclaiming this well, you're going to pre-assume that what you have is a tangent plane, as opposed because you're pre-assuming that you that the horizon you're seeing is a refracted position that's refracted from a globe's geometric horizon, and the word horizon can't obviously fit no, no, on this a won't do. because it. <laughs> okay, okay, I follow that. The only problem is that the the purpose of the question in terms of any evidence that you can acquire said elevation angle measurement from said curved baseline, is in reference to Earth. And how you're actually utilising this elevation angle, the, the purpose in terms of the argument, is in regards to, specifically in regards to, celestial navigation. Well, when you describe drawing out a tangent plane from... How did you phrase it again? You did it really cleverly. <laughs> I can't remember how you phrased it. I'm not going to go well, through it. Yeah, I, I, I used a ref claimed refracted horizon do my dip correction from, and then that dip correction allowed me to create a horizontal at my eye line, which I will claim is a tangent plane. Okay, but that tangent plane that you drew and imagined out from your eye line horizontally isn't conducive with ground positions, is it? Is it a tangent well, if it doesn't touch a sphere? Will... That's, what I, that's just where I went to, John. Hold on. John's just said, is it a tangent if it doesn't touch the sphere? Well, it's going to be touching the sphere in, in Brian's example, but at your feet. Well, no, well, because it'll problem. be at my oil line, because I'm cor correcting. See, it depends. If I'm correcting, if I'm claiming to correct, see, I, can't, I can't make any reference to a vertex that's at my oil line going down to sea level, because I need a horizontal. And that will be, if I'm believing I live on a globe, that will mean that I believe sea level is in reality a curved level. Right. <laughs> what? Sounds stupid, right? A curve level. That's what I have to believe if I'm a baller. No, that's not. But, that's not correct. And you're talking about an anti-flat Earth position that you've argued with someone. In reality, this is in this interim. We, we'd be juxtaposed, not juxtaposing, transposing. Is that the right word? Putting that plane in the middle of the globe, not believing we've got curved, yeah. zontal, bendy, zontal. 
Well, but see, I'm talking about the actual, the actual uh, creation of the angle itself. It, oh, earlier. Oh, okay, my dip, bad. No, you're talking earlier. When okay. doing, yeah, when I when I do the dip correction, I have to pre-assume that the horizon I'm seeing is only an optical point, as in there is no water there. It's it's a refracted position, and I do my dip correction based off of a belief of that being a refracted position. And I bring that uh, that line that's going from my oil 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 to the horizon up to my oil line, and that gives me the horizontal. And then when I have the horizontal, that allows me to then have an angle, and I then take that angle and subtract it from 90 degrees, and then what's left, I then I then bring sorry, I then once I have that angle, I then bring that to the centre of my globe, and then I measure an arc length. From the center of my globe, that's what I do. What about the, the other two stars? Hold on. Clear. What about the other two stars? Well, I do the same thing with them as well. That's <laughs> what I have to believe. But that, but that only, but, but I mean? the second and third star, that would only work when you start with your first reference point in Earth, in the center. It only works that way if you then follow the process in Earth after the first measurement. Yeah, but this is like uh, I'm giving you the position of what most of these people believe. No, no, I get that. Happens. I'm just I'm just pointing yeah. out that <laughs> uh, at the point that you are, you can do it all for one acquisition of one angle, as you describe, but at some point, and you did, you then transpose. Is that the right word? That top tangent plane that you've drawn from your feet or eye line, and then put that in Earth at the center of the equatorial plane with the globe Earth now wrapped around you with you in hell. Okay. But from that point, the reason you've done that is because you need a reference plane with everything on the same level surface for the next two stars that you're going to use to acquire your fix and your position with celestial navigation. Ergo, if you then try and say, well, no, I'll do the same again for the second angle, you'll only ever describe it at the equatorial plane from that point because it cannot and would not work for the second and third measurement. You can blag that you're describing a refracted point for your eye line tangent, but that doesn't make it so, and it also doesn't make it function until you incorporate the blag of moving everything to hell. Well, see, I, what I detail there is more of a anti-flat orders. Uh, understanding of it. In reality, if I'm a general baller, general global, everyday person, and I'm doing celestial navigation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create those three circles of equal uh, of equal altitude, um, and I'll have them all, all crossing at the, at the at one point, and that would be my that would be my my coordinate, right? But instead of using the circles, what I will use is what's known as lines of position which would be three crossing lines. And those lines would be like tangents to those three circles. And where those three crossing lines uh, meet, that will be my, my coordinates. So I then will get to ignore those circles. Because I'm going to, the only place I can place those circles then from there is onto the Universal Transverse Mercator map, which is, which is a globe map, right? Where they took the latitude and longitude grid that they created the globe from, after they hijacked it from flat earth measure, uh, elevation angles to Polaris. And I can then, if I want, once those three circles are placed onto that universal transverse Mercator projection, they will be distorted. And I will then re-distort them again by using the Haversheim formula and making them three circles, which aren't circles, they're actually spherical caps that meet at the same point on a globe. That I can do all that mathematically. But in reality, I've measured three circles across mean sea level, basically. That but hold on, those lines of, that's what's happened in those, reality. Those lines of position you call, they, or they say are tangents, are still straight lines on the ground. So they the are, ground must be a level. Yes. The, gra the ground must be a level plane for that to work as well. Yes, but it allows me, when I'm doing it, it allows me to ignore the three massive circles of flash I have measured with my sextant. 
it allows me to ignore those. Well, you, just you, uh, okay, I, I, I get that you've already disclaimed that you're giving me or giving us an anti-flight earther position. But when you say ignore them, well, no, they, they function, as John said, on, on a flat plane. And the, the plane that we'd be describing in this instance would be the equatorial plane at the center of a sphere earth. So while you say, well, I can then ignore them, no, no. All of the diagrams that you'll find will, will show you how you can acquire this first angle, describe a tangent plane that doesn't go out to a point that's a GP, it then gets transposed because they all have parallel light rays coming in, and therefore it matches the light that's going to the centre. Yeah, that works fine for one to get you to the equatorial plane in hell. But do it with all three, suddenly, no, no, it doesn't work anymore. But they, well, no, you can't get, you they can't don't get do that. One. With oh, oh, hold on, John. Go ahead, Brian. They don't do, they, that's something the anti-flat earthers do. But celestial navigation don't do that. No. Celestial navigation, go, do, what I mean is that they will show the, that happening maybe in some of their diagrams. But in reality, they don't do that. So everything is going on to maps and, uh, and forms that are designed Let's say forms that are designed for uh, for a line of position crossing. The, the, everything is being done on a table. None of this is happening on a sphere. Sphere, but they can make a video that shows all uh, the shows that they bring it to the center of the globe. Blah blah blah. But none of that actually happens. Everything they do, although the projections they're using, eventually like the Universal Transverse Mercator, that's based off of a globe. But the point is, it's still flat. Everything they're doing is flat even within their world. But the anti-flat earthers think, they actually think that that was because Prototav made a video where he drew circles on a toy globe. And some of the ballers actually think there's people out there on ships drawing circles on toy globes. Got, that's, what, like just, that, uh, that's what we're dealing with. Let's just go to John because he had something to add in a second. But I will just say, 70 people, just over 71 people watching, very warm welcome. Pleased to have you. Obviously back in the... Driving seat, as we should have been yesterday, but I wasn't. So, <laughs> there we go. Please share the show. It's very good to have you. And an announcement. There's something very, very important just happened in the last couple of minutes. Adam Meekin has arrived. Very exciting. Please share the show. Excellent. First hello. of all, I'd like to say hello, Adam. Oh, um, I would too. But... Go ahead, John. But the, the main point is the parallel light that they would assert that would give them the ability to transpose these angles to the center of the sphere uh, doesn't deal with the question of how you get an angle from a curve. It is a red herring at best, because even with parallel light, you will still need a flat plane to measure your angles against. It's almost non sequitur. Yeah, at so many points in the process, you require Earth to be flat for this to function. Well, it's a two-dimensional thing situation, although nothing is really two-dimensional in, in the world, but it is a two-dimensional situation, as in fundamentally, mean sea level is just a straight horizontal plane, right? And you're using mean sea level to measure those three, these three circles on. So everything, and then you're using a map, right, that you're placing your lines of position, even if you're not putting in full circles on, or you're using a form, uh, um, a line of position form, I can't remember the proper name for it. So, and that's a flat piece of paper. Everything you're doing is flat. Every single thing you're doing is flat. Your belief of what you're doing doesn't come into it. Uh, it that can be your own personal belief, but everything you're actually doing, involve, it's a two-dimensional thing. Because... If you're using the latitude and longitude grid, that's a two-dimensional grid. So or, you know, you're, you're trying to find out your coordinates in relation to the coordinates of the GP point of Polaris, which, and, uh, because that's a coordinate that never, never changes. So you're trying to find out your coordinates in relation to that, right? And that's on a two-dimensional grid. The, the latitude and longitude grid can't work without it being two-dimensional, without it being a horizontal plane. So right. no matter what they want to believe, they, they're still always on a, a flat plane. Exactly. Every time that coordinate system is mentioned, it doesn't matter that they've got a ball belief or how they understand it to be, let's get this right, 
transposed onto a globe by the Haversine, projected out onto a tube, and then rolled out flat as the transverse Mercator, to then be able to call what is a flat plane grid that's been derived from circles that move around Polaris when they're put on a crisscross grid instead of a circular grid. But in between the conversion process, they converted it onto a sphere via Haversine. Therefore, they can say that the transverse Mercator is a globe projection. Therefore, Earth's a globe. It's like, no, but why did it need to be transposed back onto a flat grid, regardless of it not being circular anymore? Well, because it's a flat plane that you're dealing with. And it only works and functions that way. That's how the latitude and longitude system was created in the first instance. It is a flat plane grid system. Well, the latitude and longitude grid is something that was measured and has to be measured across a horizontal plane. So it's a horizontal plane, two-dimensional grid. And it's based around time. If it, like, you know, uh, um, uh, Greenwich Mean Time. All that is ba like, that's all based around the latitude and longitude grid, which will be shown in the time zone presentation later. Because time zones prove it. But the thing about it is, is once they took that grid and they made all the south ends of the lat longitude lines meet, uh, they created a globe of radius 3959 miles. And then they took all those latitude and longitude positions on a globe and they made them into a cylinder. And that cylinder is called the Universal Transverse Mercator, which is just a big rectangle flat map. But it has, an, has all the all the continents and countries in the wrong positions, let's just say, in relation to each other. So then you can put your three circles onto that map, which will instantly distort the circles, and then use the Haversheim formula after that to make that map, that uh, projection, into a globe again. But none of it means anything, because everything you've measured is flat. You haven't measured anything that's not flat. Sorry to, to cut you off, just one second. And so, you want. Just one sec. Divergent Droid in the chat has just dropped your video in there, which I encourage everybody to go and watch. So be here or be sphere for the Brian Logic's YouTube channel and his video, How Latitude Lines Are Derived from Elevation angle Angles to Polaris. And that's on Brian's Logic. And the video is called Polaris Kills the Globe. End of story. And there's a link whizzing its way by that's been posted by Divergent Droid. So check that out. Give it a like. Leave a comment. Give Brian some algorithmic love. And I wanted to just uh, speak up for the Earth for a bit because I think that all this reminding of its flat measurements and all that's very hurtful because we all know this the Earth is transspherical now. So please address it as the sphere that you can think of it as despite measuring it flat. I see. The sphere you can... Arwin's English just badly comes across. The sphere you can think of it as, in other words... The flat plane, well, as a globe believer, you're imagining it akin to somebody who is transgender by analogy, thinking they are male when female or female when male. You can think of Earth as being globe-shaped. It isn't. It's flat. Yes. It may identify as globe-shaped, but it isn't. Right, but if you constantly say it's actually flat, that's spherophobic. That's really mean. It's very, very big. Uh, yeah, there's got to be something that they can define it as, are we? And you might be onto something because they can't define it in religious terms or as we discussed the other week, as a protected group. It shows too much weakness. It has to be accepted as reality. Therefore, how can you stop people? Well, they've done it algorithmically with us, haven't they? The, the opposers of the religion of the globe, heliocentrism, are us. Well, what do you do with your opponents? You suppress them to the bottom of the YouTube algorithmic searches and then have anybody who opposes you come up at the top of the list. Done. Yes, that works statistically. But you could also consider that, well, maybe the way they're going about it is that they know Earth is flat. It's just that it can't handle. The Earth itself can't handle that it's flat. It'd like to be think, thought of as spherical. So it's basically transspherical. That's a reification and fallacy. The the surface of the earth, the soil, the ground, that has no opinion. That's a reification. You're hurting Earth's feelings, Nathan. No, no. Mother Nature has no feelings. There is no Mother Nature. 
I didn't say Mother Nature. Well, said Earth. Gaia, Earth. Well, it has no like... feelings. It's not a person. It doesn't have lungs. It's not sentient. It doesn't care how I identify it. When I found out that I'd been lied to about it being globe shaped, the ground didn't open up and spring hallelujahs for me and go, La, you realize how flat I am? No, no, it didn't do any of that. It didn't it care. Didn't. You it had no, no means of caring. You really missed out on that. Must have missed it when that happened. Oh, it did that for you, did it? Did the ground open up and sing hallelujahs for Arwen? Well, I heard trumpets in the distance. That was just the acid 2012. that you dropped. That was nothing to do with flat earth. Yeah, well, no. um, just you can only the, uh, that loud from that big a distance if the earth is flat. Somebody's trying to over talk at uh, fast, Arwen. Go ahead, John. Right. Well, as far as the algorithm goes, because it was fairly serious for a moment, I think it's a little bit unfair that NASA can utilize the plane of reference to detail how orbits work um, or celestial navigation can use the plane of reference to, um, you know, tell people how to navigate. But if we just point out the plane of reference, we are suppressed. Yeah. That, that seems... Uh, Seems a bit contradictory to me. Well, no, no, what's suppressed is flat Earth, in quotes. Now, we bitch and moan quite frequently about how we do not necessarily want to be tarred with the same brush of flat Earthism. And we've even got descriptive words for the process that you will go through when you arrive at this subject, namely the Feast of Nonsense. Well, if we're decrying all of those things, and it is those things that in the algorithmic sense you're discussing, have required, from their point of view, suppression, then would you not applaud the suppression when we're talking about the nonsense? Uh, just while I want just as you've just flashed up on screen, right, on this, the reel. So, Jaron, back in the day, pointed out on YouTube, I think it was SpaceX as opposed to NASA, it might have been NASA, they did a launch live. That is to say, that what you received, like now, we are live. Obviously, if you're watching after the fact, it's not. But it will tell you under the video, this was broadcast live. And what you also get is this, which is the chat. So you can then see that there's a chat that runs alongside that people have reacted to. So somebody hopefully will, will, will confirm this now. So if I say, Duncan... If you can just say hi from the chat or something that indicates that this is genuinely live to make my point. Now, once this video is concluded, I can edit this video. But what would happen is the live chat would go away because it no longer matches time-wise with what's happened live. So there's no longer a live chat. Now, back in the day, I you know, had the live stream with a chat on screen all the time, but that isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the chat that's next to, not in this video that you're looking at now. So if you were to press the button on the underneath the video that says live chat, it would come up. Now that was the case for SpaceX. They did a live stream, they do a live launch to Narnia, but there's a problem. There's a continuity error that's caught by people like Jaron. And he points it out because Jaron like he used to do back in the days when he was excellent and did things like the ISS watch, was closely monitoring their live stream and broadcasting it himself and could show the continuity error when they went to Narnia. Now, upon this revelation that there was something not quite right in their live, in quotes, stream, I'm going to say SpaceX, went back in to the video obviously with the help of YouTube, and edited a live stream. Now, no indication under the video changed. As far as anybody who comes back after the fact is concerned, that is how it went out live. But it wasn't. It's a total lie. YouTube assisted SpaceX in lying to the audience about what is reality. Live broadcast reality. Yeah. Now, as far as I'm concerned at that point, when... YouTube, if they're in on the gig, I don't know. 
um, are prepared to broadcast this crap as being live when it's clearly edited together footage that they're just broadcasting from a computer. None of us would get away with that SpaceX. It's the basis of our reality, right? They're buying into that crap. So it's tolerated to the point where not only is it tolerated after the fact mistakes in a broadcast that's supposed to be live can be altered. And that was caught by Jaron and pointed out by Jaron. Now, these days, when it comes to NASA's requirements for a flat plane, this is where I was going with all of this. Back then, that seemed very important. How they pull the wool over your eyes through the methodology. It's like an appeal to format fallacy. Because in reality, what are, what are they actually doing? What are they describing? What are the coordinates for their trip? <laughs> They'll all need a flat Earth. So he gives a toss about the continuity errors. But then it seems so important. <gasps> what a revelation! They've changed something that's supposed to be... Yeah. Yeah, it's all based on a flat Earth, though. Here you go. There's their flat Earth in it. See these coordinates? That's all flat Earth measurements, that is. <laughs> See this derivation of their map? That's all a flat Earth. Yeah? Every bit of this all leads back to a flat plane. So what does it matter that they put up a little bit of hocus pocus on the screen and said it was live? Yeah, they need their flat earth to do it. There you go. That's I, it. Yeah, and I think that when they did that, I don't think that YouTube was in on it. I think that they actually kind of cleverly hacked the information and just replaced the video information. Absolutely no way. While leaving no. YouTube, think it was always live there. No way. No how. As far as this is concerned, I'm 100% behind Jaron with his conclusion. As as a, You don't even know the terms of service, Arwen. You've got no right to make comment, even though you're a YouTuber. There is absolutely no way they could have done that without the assistance of YouTube. They cannot edit a YouTube video and leave it as live. As live is a slightly different term. Do you know what as live means? Well, yes, but they can if they don't use the standard YouTube interface, basically bypass the entire uh, software interface to doing these things and just, like a hacker, swap out data, which would be the video data that is left there, right? I'll so just, outside uh, of the YouTube I'm interface... I'm going to say, okay, you've, you've weaseled it into a scenario. Uh, what is a fallacy name for this? But anyway, I can't remember the fallacy name. You've weaseled it into a position where it's se semi-plausible. So I can't disagree with you. Okay, okay. so your postulation is that bloody uh, uh, SpaceX have hacked their way into the YouTube mainframes, found their video that's distributed throughout their, their massive array of hard drives in various different chunks and edited it on the fly without YouTube knowing, no. I'm just going to say, well, no. <laughs> well, when you say it like that, Nathan, I mean, it's likely that they probably figured out about it and basically like, like, hmm, okay, we'll just let you do that. Because I think that YouTube lets a lot of people get away with what seem like shady things that happen with channels and trolls and all that. I mean, there's accounts going around that literally unban themselves that's absolutely logically impossible yet it just happens on the fly so i think that youtube is like would rather like just close an eye for it and just like oh yeah you do that whatever but they've got no means I of do doing that. it that's my point throughout the back end of youtube there is no means to do that anyway let's so just... not through youtube <sighs> but they would see it happening and just let it happen no okay no being more. that it's my point that it's majoring on the miners now in 2023 to look at going to narnia videos and criticize whether or not they're live given that all of the measurements the telemetry every single map and graph and chart all relies and is derived from a flat plane do you think i want to carry on with this conversation about whether or not youtube are in on it that's kind of missing the point, yes. Arwin. Yes, we do. Because, I mean, yeah, we know we're going to need a flat Earth for that, for like everything, for even ge geometry itself, and no doubt for the origins of language and all that. It requires a flat plane. I'm not even joking. But the point is, is that it's still good to know that there is this illusion of a globe that's being actively 
like behind the scenes known and man- helped out to manipulate people with it. Yes, well, I agree. I agree. And I, so I agree. Still and to learn about it. I agree. And I applauded Jaron for making that point four years ago. Yeah, me too. It was a good discovery. It was four years ago, but times move on. Now, every bit of telemetry that they've ever said they've lost, should we focus on the fact they say they've lost it or the fact that they're going to need a flat earth for it? 83 watching, please share the show. I think it's all a bit distracted away, though, because of uh, science not proving anything. That, that yeah, there you go. Water, that I can get behind. Water, didn't it? Yes, that I can get behind. Yeah, focusing on the how is a lot more interesting. Yeah, when it comes to how they've... Well, you take this brain, Arwen. It's your point. Go ahead. Well, it's good to know like what's going on with the deception and how these organizations and these groups with their own interests, how they go about in social media and in news, manipulating and tricking people. And it's good to, to keep track of that, of like how the mind works in order to know how people are being manipulated, right? And that's just the, the sociological information that is completely separate from the mathematical, geometric, scientific information where the Earth definitely has is flat, measured, right. and all a, that. There's a certain group of people, not necessarily flat earthers either, maybe people who have never even come across this subject, that are open to the level of manipulation that the world has on offer and seeing how it's done so that they can then move on with their life and essentially ignore it. You know, that is the, the worst case scenario for the people employing these tricks. And they are just tricks. And right. like when I was at college, what well, part of the course was um, circus skills. Now, circus skills makes it sound like we had elephants. We didn't. <laughs> what we did have was, you know, learning about how magic tricks were done. In fact, at one point, I ran a little magic stand with a, with a friend of mine in, in the middle of Stratford, which is a very theatrical town you know, selling fiery juggables and things like that. Anyway, the point is that when you learn how to do those things, it's all you're interested in when you see someone else doing a trick. You know there's a trick to it, and you're just trying to figure out how it's done. That's it. Now, people like Penn and Teller have made an entire show of this. Them uh, sat in the audience, effectively, but with a camera on them, watching a dude on stage try and pull off a trick without them figuring out how they've done it and essentially that would be me in this scenario you just look for how the trick's being done in other words you don't take in the news let's let's you know let's not actually pick a i was going to pick a news I topic of the moment but chances are convinced. i'll get rumpus right. or talked over go ahead Sorry. Arwen. i was just saying you're not out to be convinced or bes- yeah persuaded yeah. by on a direction you're just trying to see how they're doing it exactly you don't look at the news story and go i wonder how true this news story is you go where's the trick what's up the sleeve (laughs) where's the sleeve (laughs) that's all you're looking for and like i say there's a group of people 90 people watching oh people are sharing the show really appreciate and super chats coming in uh, hopefully won't lose my train of thought while I shout out the super chat. Sebastian Tello, thank you very much for the super chat. Hey guys, great morning. It certainly is. It's good to be back. Thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate the support. Um, I, I'm specifically referring to people that JLB re- refers to as the alternative truth community, the alt or whatever he calls it. Well, those people aren't necessarily even influenced in any way, shape or form by what we do in terms of the nature of Earth specifically. But what they are doing which we all typically here do also is know that there's a trick afoot and just look out for where the trick is as opposed to go i wonder how much it's true about um this this story of a war in zimbabwe you know (laughs) you don't you don't look at it in those terms anymore right it's not about what is true it's like how are they trying to fool you Exactly. Because that's happening a lot out there. Right. But on our and journey... You can learn a spot uh, uh, like, there's how an do overriding you know point, there's a likelihood that you're being fooled versus, no, this is just something that's just quickly moving by? Well, talking of moving by, that was the point I was going to, to link it back to John's point, which is to say that he, and I want to... Oh, 
definitely want to inherit this from him, is just looking for where the highway is. That's all he's looking for, on-ramp signs, right? On-ramp signs so he can get his Ferrari or Lamborghini up to speed. That's all he's looking for. Yeah, so he's not, he's, not, the, he's not looking at... Exit. Yeah, he's not looking at some, some globe representation where they go, no, 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 look, 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 look. Check it out. Here I am. I'm at the top of the globe. Here's my three lines to refracted horizons and then three descriptions as per Brian, each one transposed to the centre individually so it does work on a globe. When John hears that, he's not looking at it going, how does this make Earth a globe? Because it's so beyond that. It's like, how does this need a flat Earth? How's the trick being done? Where's their sleeve? Yeah? Yeah, you you are looking at the news, asking uh, how much of this are they asking me to believe, rather than how much of this should I discount, kind of thing. I've got a better but example. Be careful there. When you watch a movie, you suspend disbelief, and you will assess the movie after you finish watching it on how quote believable the movie was, but you accept at a fundamental level that it's a movie and it is not real. Yeah, you, you understand that implicitly, right? Now, when it comes to watching the news, 99% of people do not accept the same exact truth. Now, for me, I'll just speak for me. When I watch the news, which I don't, if I were to watch the news, which I don't, I would look at it and go, how believable is this? <laughs> how well has this made me suspend disbelief? Yeah? Can I immerse myself in the reality this gobble box is giving me right now? Or not? That's the terms right. that I look at it in. Now, average normie, oh no, how many have died in Zimbabwe? Do you see the difference? Yeah. Well, I always look, whenever I see any news clips or the whole thing, I'm always thinking, how are they trying to manipulate me? What agendas are they trying to push? And that's it, pretty much, because like it's always there, whether you look at it or not. They're always trying to manipulate. Yeah, that, that's the annoying bit. Whether you look at it or not, as much as I stopped watching TV in my teenage years and got rid of TV licensing and TV in general, it, it's everywhere. You can't help it. The propaganda machine manages to weasel its way into all walks of life everywhere you look in modern yeah. society. If you don't get it through the TV or the radio, you're going to get it through other people repeating that TV or radio. But just in the language itself. Go, go on, Brian, or whoever it was, John, that's trying to get a word in. Go ahead. What? Yeah, what? I just want to say... I was just want to... We'll go John then. John then, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to say you got to be careful with this, though. Because when you're looking for that highway to truth, you have to know the truth first. Uh, yeah. looking at someone and trying to decipher what the truth is without any information is a dangerous path and that that can compromise you so yeah, be it, careful it's the equivalent of of having the sat nav guide you to the highway now the people who don't have any clue how the roads underneath the highway work and don't know where they are there's a good chance that that person might end up being led into a river by the sat nav Anyway, well, the, the, what I what I have the question I've never really thought about this, but it, the natural question that always comes to my mind and has done for a very long time when it comes to the mainstream news is what? How are they set to gain from this? Like whatever I'm telling you, the first thing that's in my mind is how are they set to gain from me accepting what they're telling me? You know what I mean? So that'll tell you the, the lack of trust that's there. It's like I'm instantly thinking they're telling me a story because they've got something to gain from it, as opposed to it's news that would be worthy of telling me or informing people. Shout out to Steph for smashing the super chat. Thanks for all you guys do. Oh, thanks for all you do, guys. Thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate it, Steph. Yeah, it's just I, I would caution people with just because they're someone is wrong doesn't mean they're always wrong. And just because you found out something is false doesn't mean everything is false. 
So just be careful in your discernment and try to use logic and reason to take in the information that you're getting and base it against what you do know. However, uh, as a generalized position goes, you're not gonna, maybe not going to like this refractive curvature, but in my humble opinion, those out there who auto-hoax, you ever heard that term? Yes. No. An auto-hoaxer is someone that takes essentially the position that I described a moment ago, which is to say that you turn on the TV, the news comes on, and b before the news report has even ended, you go, hoax. It's automatically a hoax, regardless of what the what the information is. Just accept that all of it is hoax. Yeah, that's an auto hoaxer, as the name suggests. Now, I would suggest I'm not that person, but I would suggest that that person is right more often than the person who takes the garbage off the telly box at surface level and accepts it. I would say that the auto hoaxers got more chance of being right more of the time than the person that accepts the surface level as right. I agree. No, that, that's, that's a reasonable position to take. That's fine. And you can take, I'm not going to argue that against you. I'm just saying that you don't know that. And that is your, the way that you deal with it personally. And I, I can't have a problem with that, but, but you don't know. You don't know, but it's even things that were benign. I remember uh, in my very, not my very first job, but one of the first careers I had was in, retailing audio equipment and next door to the shop was a charity shop and bbc came out with one of their at the time reasonably famous reporters to do a little piece on this charity shop and they did the piece to camera and we watched them set up and contrive and script what they were going to say and what they were going to talk about and how the talking points were going to be done and we because they were literally right outside the shop we could hear the conversations now since then going forward in my career i actually actively worked with tv and did those things with the with the production crew and in fact changed the outcome of some of the <laughs> some of the tv um stuff that i did was physically altered by my intervention in other words the outcome changed and what the, was then presented to the public was changed because i'd done something you can have that much direct influence if you're physically producing something well in in the case of that it was to a degree it was contrived it was the gadget show but what I'm referring to back in the day when it was this hi-fi shop next door to a charity shop, the way they made the magic of this charity scene was very different to the rat-infested hovel behind the shop that was piled high with 200 tonnes of crap that couldn't be sold that people had dumped in black bags day after day after day after day, all day long, right? Now, none of that got shown, none of that got mentioned, and what did get mentioned and discussed was entirely contrived for what was a drop the dead donkey fluff piece that undoubtedly went right at the end of the news. But what struck me was that even at that level where it's something totally benign, they still contrive it. Anyway, that's my piece for auto hoaxing. If you're an auto hoaxer, good for you, more power to you. Me personally, I, 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 I'm indifferent to the point where there's convincing or compelling evidence to a make me interested in it <laughs> before anything else and it's getting more like that day after day with flat earth for things that seemed so important that's why i was trying to make the point got angry with arwin earlier because some things that seem so important in this subject turn out to be incredibly benign so insignificant in the in the big scheme of things that you go what's this worth to me same with some of the argument points i'll give you the best example the horizon right we've discussed that for the entire show well a good chunk of it at the beginning when we we're doing housekeeping right well as a flat earther you i'm talking directly to you and pointing my finger at you as an audience member as a flat earther you've got no right to be interested in the horizon it serves no interest to you now you might go well what about proving earth's flat with the navigation what are you a navigator what does it matter? Yes, we can use it as argument points when we take it and specifically reference it to how you can save your life at sea. We can give it the drama. We can give it the impact. We can make people understand how Earth is flat. But let's just look at this a different way. Who cares? Do, do you need the horizon ever for anything? I mean, dead serious. I'm looking at you, you as an audience member. Ask yourself that question. You go, well, we've got to argue about how it's refracted or how it does something in the distance, or how boats go over it. Have you? Just stop. Why? 
have you, a flat earther, got to explain any of those things? The answer yeah, is you don't. Yeah. Thank you for stealing my thunder. You don't. Sorry. Our opponents might have a positive assertion they need to defend. But what you can do is go, I don't believe you. And literally draw a line under it. What's that? You think I should do something? No. I've no interest in the horizon. I couldn't care less. What's that? You've got boats going over it proving a sphere Earth. Get to proving that to me. Yeah? I'm going to set the standard so high. But what actually happens is they take that really high standard and put it on you, the flat earther. You've got no need for the horizon. You don't need it. So why are you arguing about it? Are you interested in it? Does it help you somehow? No. You've fallen victim to a burden of proof reversal fallacy where your opponent desperately needs the horizon to make claims about it so desperately that it's far more effective as a positive fighting point to put that onus on you so you can fail. And you've got no interest. You've got no use for it. Go ahead, Darwin. Right, because we have no geometric claim. They need it. And they really need it. And yep. We don't really need it. We only have to disprove their claim, basically. That's what you're saying. Oh, we don't even have to do that. We disprove their claim. How dare you? I've got better things to do. Dishwasher to fill. No, no. You prove your positive assertion that the horizon is somehow interesting to me. And when you've got my interest, first and foremost, then you can set about actually proving your physical geometric claim based on an earth curve you say the horizon is. You will prove that to me. Not the other way around. Let's get it clear. Well, it's very easy to do it. We just say black swan. And then they say refraction. And then we say, what's refraction? And then it goes to hell and into math and art orthographic view. No, we don't. Do, we do not do that. What The reason that has been done is based on the fact that we have had the positive assertion put to us and taken it apart based on its assertion that the Earth is a sphere by how, whoever is making it. Now, our taking apart proactively a positive claim is something we should be thanked for, for the efforts that we put in where our opponents failed to prove that, get my tongue around it, prove their positive assertion. That is upon them to do. The onus is on them. Globe Earth Horizon, you say? Prove it. Don't ask me for anything. How dare you? Got better things to do. And on that joyful note, I'm going to say if you're watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Fortunately, if you are watching this live, though, this is where we bid you farewell. I, uh, ignore us. You have the mainstream trying to bury us. Uh, it, it's yeah. coming from all directions. That's not entirely all true. Remember, Nathan also missed like a week, and before he also had breaks. That also contributes, guys. It does, no, it does, no, I'm no, not no, talking no. about that. I know that. Does. I know that does, but I, I'm just saying that, like, it seems like everyone around us wants our head. Is how it feels at the moment. I ain't saying it is that way. I'm just saying it. Kind of get that feeling. And to be sure they're not promoting. If anything, they're promoting us less than they were already hourly promoting us. So, I, uh, what can you do with power for the core? You know, it's, that's the arena we're in. That's the topic we chose. It's, it's the most unpopular topic out there, I think. Um, maybe not the most annoying, but it's most unpopular. Go back to what Nathan was saying there at the end of the live show. Um, I, I couldn't get in before I finished, but I remember many times being told that it was on me to prove that the Earth was flat and not a globe, as I was the one who was going against what everyone else knew to be true. Uh, when the truth was, and I said it, like, well, it's not on me. I'm not the, like, I mean, you have to prove your globe. You know what I mean? You must prove, if you're claiming the earth is a globe, then you're, the pe like, people like me, like all the people listening here now, 
wouldn't exist if the evidence was there to support the Earth being a globe. It'd be, it'd be a completely pointless act to be a flat Earth, or it would be completely pointless. Why would you even be a flat Earth, or if the Earth was definitely a globe and all the evidence was there to support it? There isn't evidence to support it. That's why people like us exist. There isn't evidence to support their their claims. Their claims are too crazy. You know, so it's not on it's not on me to actually do anything because I I'm just saying no. That doesn't prove your point. When they try and present evidence, I can just Nathan is correct. I could have years ago just put my hands in my pockets and say, "Where's your evidence for that?" And when they produce it, I go, "Well, that's I would that doesn't prove it." Do you know what I mean? Because it wouldn't prove it, and I could keep that. I wouldn't have to I ever have to say any more than that. You know, I mean, to get all this, to get to that well, stage, you have to have a certain degree of understanding and knowledge and debunkings of the globe Earth claim to get to that stage. So. That's where John earlier, or refractor curvature earlier, was saying, you know, you've got to be careful. You've got to know the route underneath the highway. You can't just jump on the highway without a driving license. Um, there is a certain amount of knowledge that you must have in the first instance to get to that point where you can say, I sod off with your stupid globe claim. Prove it. And they go, no, you prove it's No, I've not got to do anything. I don't need any of these things. Get lost. But you, you, you have to have a certain knowledge to be able to reach that sort of attitude. Well, you have to have a certain level of confidence uh, about how things go, how these conversations go, that you know where it's going to lead so that your curiosity has been satisfied about the entire procedure. So you could just basically shove it away. Like, no, I already know how that's going to go. You've got to be and able then, to answer their question, yeah. aren't you? When you go to them, you're going to need a flat earth for that. When they then go, why? That's where you need to know. You've got to be able to answer that why, haven't you? As opposed to just confidently saying it. The knowledge base is when they say why, you explain to them why you're going to need a flat earth for that elevation angle. Why you're going to need a flat earth for whatever else they're claiming when you've invoked it. Yes, indeed. And we would hope, or I would hope, that the audience is definitely not sub 80 IQ and appreciates when they hear someone like refracted curvature pointing out that shortcut mid discussion about the complexities of Coriolis effect and non-inertial and inertial turning reference frames and the consequences of a globe earth being the non-inertial reference frame that would induce Coriolis if you were standing on it looking up at something deflected at 15 degrees an hour for John to come along and go <clears throat> do you say latitude you're going to need a flat earth for that and it's all to chuckle and then make car noises and talk about going over the highway well, if you've got sub-80 IQ and you hear that and then you're into a discussion with a globe believer and they start talking about, what were we talking about then? A uh, Coriolis effect. And you go, oh, you're going to need a flat earth for that. And then the glober turns around and says, as Adam just did, why? And you go, because you need a flat earth for everything. All roads lead to a flat earth. And you start parroting off our catchphrases rather than the evidence or arguments. You're going to have a bad day then. <laughs> Yeah, I think to get to that level of nonchalantness, you need to you need to go through the learning of everything first, or of all the yeah. subjects first. It's I remember was it Jimi Hendrix said, uh, "You must learn all about how to play a guitar before you learn all the rules of it before you 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 you're in a position to break them or something." Exactly. Like that. My my daughter's yeah. learning that about art. My daughter loves drawing and art. So one of the classes I put her in and have done for many years now is a is an art class with about five other kids, four other kids, depending on the day. And the teacher explains to her at nausea that the, the people who are breaking these rules first had rules that they had to learn really, really well. And then she occasionally will give an example of someone who didn't learn all the rules and starts off by breaking rules they didn't know. And you look at it and go, hmm, yeah, it's all right. And then you learn how they were ridiculed throughout their entire career, only to be appreciated a hundred years later for various reasons. But, you know, you learn about how the great art, the great artists progressed the art through what seemed at the time to be absolutely groundbreaking and rule breaking. But in reality, looking back a hundred years later, you go, well, no, that's actually only a subtle change to what they already knew to be really good art. So that subtle change at the time seemed groundbreaking but they knew what to subtly change 
in order to get the effect. Yeah, personalize it kind of thing. Yeah. Well, when you when you go, brown. Yeah, you're gonna need a flat. To me, I'm only doing that, so I'm I'm setting myself up to have some more fun. I've done it because I now want to show them their arse, show them why that silly statement they just made, and I'm gonna unload all the detail, be that elevation angles, select doesn't matter which which point we're addressing. But the reason I'm doing that sarcasm is so that I can then give them a lecture um, containing all the information that I know that enables me to go, you're going to need a flat earth for that. Yeah. It's an opportunity. It's kind of a, a boast almost, isn't it? Because when you're saying that, I said, it's not, it's not an empty statement. You're saying it specifically so that you can, Take the conversation forward. You, you're saying it's a, it's, a, it's a warning to them. I've got you by the short and curlies. You just don't even realise it yet. Um, but we have an opponent that does the regurgitation of surface puke at all levels of society, regardless of if they're opposing us as anti-flat earthers or just literally regurgitating the surface puke of heliocentrism. Now, in anti-flat earth terms, the example would be refraction. How many times have you had somebody say that to you? Huey points it out all the time. They don't even know how to define it. But yeah, they're parroting it. We don't you suffer that necessarily here. Flat Earth does, in quotes, but we, Flat Earth debate, do not necessarily suffer that. Our audience isn't that stupid, or at least I hope it isn't. Well, you know, it's interesting too, because just saying that macaque refraction, they'll, uh, they'll be invoking horizontal boundary layers. Um, you're going to need a flat earth for that refraction yeah it's it's just it's everywhere once you see it you just got to see it first before you start declaring it I love it well, would I be correct I think I've been oh, well, I, I know I'm pretty much correct in saying that our opposition spend a lot of time learning the wrong thing. And then they come and try to attack us and we need to learn the right thing. And that's why we always end up having more information than them. Or understanding the topic better, because that seems to be an ongoing trend where they don't understand even their own topic. You know, it seems to be an ongoing thing. And even if you correct them several times, you will still witness them you know, uh, representing in one of our own arguments, for example, incorrectly. It's like, you were corrected twice on this, and you still don't get it. You're not going to wait. It's like, why are you incapable of learning the right thing? You know, even within your own claim. I don't know why, why they do that. But they just... Maybe... maybe done you know. I can explain it. Like, why ballers do ignore the entire new insights is because they're not done yet with the way they're doing it they're not done yet with their globe belief that's how i managed to like just put it away from me when i couldn't handle it it's like i'm not done yet with this with this globe thinking and all of that so that that's, they're, they can't handle it they're go they're going to ignore it because they just, they just love doing what they do. I mean, it's a great joy to to be a, a genuine globe believer. It's very fantastical. Like all these endless possibilities about the future, if you choose to look at the good things about it, right? There's also a gloomy side that you can get over focused on. But oh. that's why, I think. Well, I find it strange that so many of them have this matter-of-fact attitude towards the European globe, where they'll literally say something to you or tell you something, and they're automatically pre-assuming that the Earth is a globe and this thing is happening on this globe they believe that the Earth is. It's like, how can you pre-assume? Like, if you go back to 2015, I don't understand it. It's the game they learn first to do that yeah. first. 
Yeah, but if you're, they're going to stand in 2015, but if you're coming into, if you've been around this arena even for a year, I just couldn't. Like, I mean, you ha how can you just pre assume? You can't just pre assume. Like, once you're met with any kind of opposition to what you just pre assumed, you can't, I, you, I don't see how you could ever just pre assume again. Well, look, it just makes it, sense. That's, yes, but they, uh, people are specifically, colloquially, by just the people, not even by curriculum, <laughs> who do that. Very early. They're taught to do it very young. So, yeah, they shouldn't be doing it, but they're taught to do it very young. And, and it's very hard to let go of that freedom. It's written into the model, isn't it? Their model, that, this model that we've never seen or read. They love this model, and they always ask you for your model. There has to be a model. We can't cope without this model. It's like it's their comforting blanket, this model, and they don't well, want to let it go. Dream. It's their dream. It's like, so what is your dream that is perfect like mine? That's basically what they're saying. Yeah, they don't know what a, a good, model good, is. Good way of uh, analyzing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the you presuppositions are in the model. They're, you know, the, the, it's all in the model. It's all there for them to exactly. repeat, rinse and repeat, all the presuppositions. I presented, you know that argument about the airplane is six miles above the Mariner and they're both at 45 degrees north latitude and they both have the same angle to Polaris. Now, for the Mariner, the claim is, the official claim is, and this has to be the official claim, it can never change, is that what's blocking his view to Polaris, why that, why that person only has a 45 degree Angle is because there is a massive geometric earth curve in his way, right? Or her way, whichever. But where is the earth curve in the way of the pilot who also is getting 45, a 45 degree angle to the same Polaris, same celestial body at the same time? Right? What's blocking 45 degrees for that person, let's just say? And when I presented that to a group of I don't think these people ever came across us. These group of boarders online who were who were uh, there was some guy some 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 guy saying he was correcting for Coriolis when he was shooting. It was a load of rubbish. But when I presented that to them, after rigmarole with a few of them, I got the question of how does it work on your flat earth? It's like <laughs> I don't have a claim about the mariner having their their view to Polaris blocked. Uh, you know, by Earth curve. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't have to explain any of these things. It's you who has that claim. That's your global claim. Well, I have so a... come the, the pilot's not being blocked by right. Earth curve. I have a question for the Globers then from that same type of perspective, right? So why don't pilots in airplanes that fly very high, why don't they see at least a part of the uh, basically the celestial sphere that supposedly completely surrounds the earth why don't you see the further part of it why does the horizon why does the whole thing arise with you when you go up vertically and you don't see the other side of the celestial sphere appear like from beyond these, yeah, the, the geometric horizon. That's You're it. not seeing around the corner of anything. Yeah, exactly. Why don't you see the rest of the stars below, right? You don't. But, so your question is, why does the position where surface level appears to meet the sky rise with you as you go vertically up? Yeah. How, do, how does someone who believes that surface level is curving right um ever get surface level to be horizontal to create the vertical and then when they say that surface level is curving they're denying the mathematics that would give them uh, a misunderstanding that there's a geometric obstruction to block it I, I don't right it totally descends into just back and forth ping pong double speak that's what happens <laughs> well I mean, it is a mystery. They cannot explain it whatsoever. And it, like, everything they try will conflict with all their machinations. 
right? So chaos is what happens. Just change well, it as you need to go along, you know. Just make it all up. Say what you need to say at the time. Right, but but in that specific Simple. corner, it's such slippery ground that they can't safely improvise. And so they end up back and forth ping pong double speaking, as I said, like they are crashing down the slippery rock, bashing from one side of the rock to the other, right? <laughs> end up double speaking because you can improvise safely in that specific area. It's too egregious. Well, they well, are, when, in all fairness, they are trying to differentiate between two flat planes at that point. So that's what they're bouncing between. If I was a, if I was a baller, I could not, like, like I, there wouldn't, there'd be many things that you think you might be able to look past. If I was, if I was really that much of a believer, but there's cer certain things you just could not. When you rise up, right, because your angle of view is is increasing, you get to see further out in front of you, right. Now, what happens is it gives the impression to you that the horizon is rising with you. Now it's not, right. It's just you're getting to see a further, for a further big plane, right. Than you were. So it's just an optical effect. Am I but the problem about the celestial but, well, horizon, right? Yeah. Well, okay, just let me finish this point just a second, though. But how can you, you know, if you're on a globe, as you rise up, you will get to see further. Yeah, that same thing will happen. But there is no way that the what what we call the horizon can go up with you. <laughs> it has to go down and down and down. And I'm not talking about the angle between the observer and their visible horizon, because there's going to be a dip angle to that. I'm talking about the angle being far greater than that bit of a dip. It's just, that's like, no matter how much of a believer I would want to be, I could never, I could never look past that. Like, that would have signed it for me. Like, that yeah, can't no. happen, though. Sorry, you're talking about well, the geometric horizon, of course. And yeah, I'm just talking about uh, no, like the think... horizon as you rise up. As you said, like in an airplane, as you rise up, the horizon appears to rise with you. Now it doesn't, it just right, appears that the way. The apparent horizon, which is only apparent, it's a side effect of sight and the earth being flat, making it non geometrical, right? But I mean, just think of this with, with ter if you start to even consider for just a moment terrestrial refraction it all becomes even crazier because guess what the higher up you go it becomes less dense in gas right but also the terrestrial refraction becomes more <laughs> because it looks even flatter the higher up you go the horizon sticks to that same level so it's like it's bent even more dramatically the higher up you go, despite the atmosphere no. go getting thinner. It's totally insane. Well, that's the kind of insanity you have to go into and start believing. It's like, whatever this optical phenomenon is, it can't be rising, appear to rise, can't appear to rise with me. I'm supposed to be on a spherical object. It has to go down. I might be able to see further, or I have to be looking down somewhat. It can't be doing that. No matter how high well, like, I rise up, it keeps on appearing to rise with me. Go on. Go on like, you say, like you say, Bright, everything they offer is just optical phenomena, whether it be uh, a boat appearing to disappear bottom first, eclipses, uh, sunset, sunrise. These are all optical phenomena. They, they don't offer any physical geometric measurement of Earth curvature at any time ever. They just claim it's no. geometric. That's the whole thing. They continually go back and forth with reification between geometric and optical. It's a mess. Well, the thing is, though, I don't know if, uh, like, as you go up, if you were on a giant sphere and you went up and you were measuring to a geometric horizon on that giant sphere you were on, uh, as you increase an angle, the the horizon would dip away. Now, we do see the horizon dipping away, but 
like when you go to the black swan and you, you talk about the distance, it shows it's not geometric. So you're not on a geometric shape. Um, I don't know if I would go to the horizon would dip away from you as you rise in altitude because it does. Yeah, I, I but I even threw that in there, the caveat that there will be a dip between the observer and the visible horizon, but the dip is not enough for what it would have to be if you're on a globe. It would have to be a greater dip. It would have to be, especially from an airplane, it would have to be a greater dip. Now, I don't care what Neil deGrasse Tyson says, which is one millimetre off the, off the baseball. We have eyes, and our eyes can see very, very well. And there is absolutely no way that that horizon can, can, continue to, sorry, can continue to appear to rise as I rise up. You know what I mean? If I am on a globe, yeah, I'll be able to see further. But it can't, the, I'll be able to see further, but that horizon can't continually appear to rise with me. That just can't happen. But I remember, it's, it's not. It, it, you can measure that it's, it's actually falling away. I know yeah. it is. It yeah. is. Your but, angle is getting greater. I know that. It's only appears. That's why I keep on using the word appears. I, I know your eye line is above the horizon. But if it, the Earth was a globe of 3,959 miles, there'd be no way that that horizon could behave in the way it behaves. It could not do that as you rise up in altitude. That couldn't happen. I, got, I remember challenging the ballers years ago to this. Prove that the dip that I see to, to the horizon is, not, uh, is greater than mean sea level. I yeah, but, I think but I can't remember how I, how I, how I, super I, mega I, looming. Yeah, but I can't remember how I phrased it, but it was something like that. Prove that it's greater than mean sea level. Then the dip between my oil and mean sea level. A horizontal, sorry, horizontal mean sea level. And none of them would take up the challenge because they knew they wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know if I fully understand that question. Would you rephrase it slightly? Yeah, I will. Um, I used to say to the borders years ago, I used to say, because they used to try and say that the horizon was the horizon of a globe this years ago and it's dipping down and all the rest. And I said, I would say, yeah, there is a dip because I knew that the horizon was below oil level right, at all times. I said, yeah, there is a dip. I said, but the thing about it is, I said, is that can you prove that that dip is greater than the dip that would be there between my oil line and horizontal means sea level? I made the point of saying horizontal means sea level. And none of them took up the challenge because they knew there's no way to what can, how, are you, how are you supposed to prove that you can't they can't that's why they, they always have to bring a seven over six or into it because they can never they can never show the dip that's necessary that would be ne that would need need to be there to prove their globe it, it's because it doesn't exist so none of them took up the challenge when you said that horizontal mean sea level you, you kind of you block them from answering in any way. Because if they deny that level's horizontal, then the mathematics that they're gonna to use to show you that the earth is falling away will become invalid. So yeah, that's a pretty good trick. And if, if the earth was falling away, all large bodies of water which are, you know, flat and horizontal would now be flowing away and be rivers, not flat bodies of water. Right, and they are flat bodies of water. Otherwise, how could any spectacle like a light, whatever it is, right, the sun, how could it reflect like a mirror? Well, if, it would, guys, if, this like mirror was surf if the surface was spherical. I would like to remind you that they do not claim that the ground underneath the mountain is curving. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's bad. That's insane. But yeah, if you look at their math, they're, they're not claiming the ground that the surface levels curving away then um it's just a weird claim that somebody makes and has been accepted but 
yeah, it, they describe level as a horizontal plane in the mathematics. Yes, but I mean, they all use flat mathematics and flat planes that they then just think of as spherical. That's how it works. You know, you can't expect a ball believer to actually use spherical math and all that because it's ridiculous. They just claim it works like that. They can't use it. It's intangible. They actually use the flat math. They just don't say that. Yeah, um, one of the things that, you know, it, from my understanding when I was a baller was that, and it was a big argument that uh, I guess a lot of flat earthers, I'm not saying all, but a lot of flat earthers had adopted that the horizon is your eye level, you know, and you can measure that uh, dip correction. So it's put into a false dichotomy that if there is a dip correction or increase as you rise in altitude, then it must be a sphere, right? And uh, th that's demonstrable. You can show that, you know, that that does happen as you rise in altitude, that the uh, angle will increase between your eye level and the surface level. Uh, I never thought about, you know, I just described two flat planes to give me this. I, I never thought about that back then. But, and, and when you got the other side saying that it is your eye level, you know, you think that's what the actual, that you're actually having an, a valid argument and they're putting forth a false position. You know, a, a lot of it's built that way most of it is built that way indeed I want to say that one more time john in espanol uh, just in English. Can you say that one more time? Hey, man, well, Mr. When I was a baller, um, and it, it was a big argument um, when I first got into this subject, is that a flat earther would say the horizon is your eye level. But you can measure a dip from your eye level to the horizon. Right? It's dip angle correction. You couldn't measure that. But the... So I put it into a false dichotomy at the time where I thought if the uh, dip correction increases as you rise in altitude, it must be a sphere. And well, what do you know it does? I, I was affirming the consequent with it for sure, but I thought because their positive position was debunked, therefore it couldn't be a flat earth. First of it all, logical. First of all, yeah, it, that's pretty silly. First of all, I, I'd like to see that measurement of the dip angle. And when somebody's standing, you know, on the beach to the horizon, I'd like to see that measurement. Number one. With number two. Number two. I see ought to light my ass. Number two. How in the world is, on a globe is the horizon rising at all? Well, it wouldn't be. Exactly. Thank you. That exactly. Right. But it's falling away as you rise in altitude is the idea. It's not your eye level. Your eye level is going up and the dip angle is increasing. Yeah, this is predicated like on, to see those on the flat rising satellite measurements of the dip angle increasing. That's a bunch of horse shit. Why on the table at the Feast of Nonsense, there's quote, the horizon rises to eye level. End quote. Flat earther. That's why that's there on the table for you to gobble down and regurgitate. They need you to assert that it doesn't drop at all. So when it does drop a little bit, which most people are unaware of, they can say that's because it's a ball. So you making the positive claim about what the horizon does, it's back to what I said earlier. Why are you saying what the horizon should or shouldn't do as you rise in altitude? Who cares? Do you need to make that claim as a flat earther? No, you do not. 
But you're making it anyway, aren't you? Why? Because you gobbled it down at the Feast of Nonsense and now regurgitating, regurgitating it to make yourself sound smart. I know all about how the horizon works. Why did you before you found out that the Earth was flat? No, you didn't have any interest in the horizon. You still shouldn't. But what? There's loads of globers out there telling you that it's dropping, therefore a globe. And what? What? It turns out it doesn't rise to our level if you've been trained to parrot. They are proven right. Oh, what a wonderful false dichotomy that worked out to be. I mean, all we need to know is that it's it's optical. It's not physical. It's only physical in a model. The but who models cares? aren't real. But who cares, one deck? Physical, non-physical, in a model, not in a model, makes no difference to you as a flat earther. All Again, globe claims. Argument. All globe claims is my point. Go ahead, QE, sorry. I, I'm not getting the argument. I hear a lot of flat earthers. I don't know where they got this from. Uh, it's optical. That's not a fucking argument. No swearing. I'm sorry. Well, how is it's optical in relation? Now, we already know the horizon kills the globe. So, how is that? I, it's only a word, okay? How is, how is that an argument? Well, what's the argument with that? Can somebody please tell me? There's not. It's not an argument. You know, because <laughs> the the geometric horizon was supposed to be optical as well. I, I don't. It's not. <laughs> it's not an argument. Thanks. Carry on. Like when they say apparent horizon, it's kind of going back to that, but just on the other side of like arguing fallaciously. All righty then. Be my cue to round out the show. With that, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley premiering streams. Hopefully, smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, joining as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video. Day. What a lovely day!